La Vivo When Rent opened on Broadway more than a decade ago, it took the theatrical world by storm, won multiple Tony Awards, and has been performed around the world. Hello, for the American Theatre Wing, I'm Julie James, host of Broadway Names with Julie James on Sirius XM Radio. And today, we're going to take an in-depth look at musical theater. Rent was a game changer for that genre, and at its heart was composer Jonathan Larson. Following his untimely death, his family established the Jonathan Larson Grants, and the American Theater Wing has administered them for the last several years. Given annually, the grants recognize the work of emerging composers, lyricists, and book writers who match Jonathan's dream of infusing musical theater with a contemporary, joyful, urban vitality. This year, the songwriting team of Julianne Wick Davis and Dan Collins were recipients of the Jonathan Larson Grant for their musical Southern Comfort. I got music all around me. It's been singing me somewhere. And as long as it stays with me, I know I'll make it there. It's not my imagination. Ain't no wind across a tree. If you tell me you're hearing, you ain't listening properly. Joining me in the studio to start our conversation about the challenges and triumphs of musical theater are actress Heidi Blickenstaff, currently appearing in Now, Hear This, and a veteran of The Addams Family, The Little Mermaid, and Title of Show, choreographer Christopher Gatelli, whose newest musicals are Newsies and Godspell. His work in South Pacific earned him a Tony nomination. Recently, he directed Silence the Musical off-Broadway. And composer and lyricist Robert Lopez, a two-time Tony winner for his musicals Avenue Q and The Book of Mormon. Welcome. Hi. 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 <laughs> I'd love to begin. I think we can all agree that there is nothing more magical than a live performance. Mm. But what was it that drew each of you to musicals in particular? I was a very musical child and um, always kind of, uh, you know, my mom tells stories of me being a two-year-old and harmonizing with her when she would sing me lullabies at night. And, and um, she would park me in front of uh, the speaker when she would play Barbra Streisand albums. And I fell in love watching those MGM musicals, Singing in the Rain and, and uh, Hello, Dolly, and all of that stuff. I memorized that. And she took me to go see a, uh, a dinner theater production of Oklahoma. <laughs> and there was a kid in that. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, this is possible for a <laughs> child to actually be on stage? And um, uh, when I was old enough, I ended up auditioning for that theater and, um, and thus began my illustrious career <laughs> in theater. But I've always definitely been, I, I think I, I've been a musician first. I've always been very, very drawn to music. Music is very, um, just so important to me. And I uh, almost, um, I would love to do other things, but I almost exclusively do musicals. Mm -hmm. um, but I've loved them, and when I saw my very first musical on Broadway, I knew, well, I've known forever that that's what I wanted to do, but my first musical was 42nd Street, and it was just like, I was 10, I was like, oh, that's it, I wanna do that, I wanna do that, and I'm lucky enough to be able to do it. Yeah, Christopher, how about you? What was it about musicals in particular? Uh, I think, well, my first experience, funny enough, was, God, was Godspell. I was, I think, five, and I saw it at a local high school or something, and, and I just, I don't, especially that show with the, with the performers running through the audience and singing and, and, and Stevens' music's fantastic and it just I don't know it just it really kind of hooked me in and then um, I started dancing when I when I was really young and then the first experience I had in the musical was uh, the national tour of Evita was was traveling the country and they were picking up kids in uh, in each city and I d did the national tour of Evita at 11 and I remembered. Just like seeing that at that age, when I was five, Godspell was a little more magical and kind of like what's what's going on, and it was so interesting. But but at eleven, to see that and witness what that can do to an audience, and and uh, and just it was fantastic. And I would after my part, I would run around to the front of the house and watch it from you know from the back, and and uh, and I knew that was that was the moment I knew that I couldn't do anything else. And Bobby, you know, you're on another side of this spectrum from the composition side. Mm -hmm. So musicals. Yeah, I was always um, I was always a musical kid. I took piano lessons and I wrote little songs um, for piano. And um, 
And I guess, you know, my parents were really into musicals. They loved, you know, West Side Story and My Fair Lady and Sound of Music and all those great movies. And I grew up in New York City, actually, so I saw a fair share of, of Broadway shows. I saw a chorus line when I was seven. Wow. Which was pretty inappropriate. And then, <laughs> I saw Follies in Concert when I was like 10, which was also kind of inappropriate. <laughs> also wildly inappropriate. <laughs> and, I was, and in my high school, there was this, I mean, my elementary school, we had this great uh, music teacher who kind of basically took over the school. You know, the fifth and sixth graders didn't learn anything mm -hmm. and just did a show. And my, you know, mine was um, uh, West Side Story in fifth grade. I got to be, a, I played a, a jet, even though I was like the only Spanish <laughs> kid in school. Um, <laughs> that makes sense. So yeah, so I started, I, and then, then I started writing um, musical, you know, songs for my little theater group. So I kind of, I was indoctrinated very early, and I like plays, but um, but I love musicals. What made you think from being in a performance, but that you could actually write something? Um, well, I had started writing music. It never seemed like a like something kids couldn't do to me because my piano teacher um, made me made me write songs every week so I was forced to write and then um, and then you know puberty hits and you kind of want to express yourself so yeah it, it, I, you know looking back I was kind of I never had a chance <laughs> <laughs> do you remember some of those songs you wrote when you were a kid yeah I wrote I wrote a, my first song was called Oy Vey What a Day <laughs> <laughs> I knew there were, were going to be gems in there and I wrote a song called The Red Tape of Society which was all about wow. you know class and love wow and, heady <laughs> and I wrote these very Sondheim-y you know wanting to be Sondheim so badly yes. that you couldn't stand to listen to the song <laughs> <laughs> so from your childhood love of musicals to what you're doing today does it feel what is the trajectory of musicals, the ones that you fell in love with versus where you feel like we are today and what musicals are doing and their relevance, if you will. Mm. Where, have they, where have they come? And later I want to talk about where are they going? I, I, I feel like there are no rules, you know, and, and you, can, you can keep pushing boundaries or you can go back and, and kind of pay homage to just the old school Thing of what we what, like, what we fell in love with, mm -hmm. you know, roll back even if it's roll drops and you know two lights or whatever it is. But I, I, that's that's kind of why I'm loving being on the side of the table so much because it, it, there are no rules and we can create something spectacular or you, we could create something like downtown with silence with four panels and two chairs or mm -hmm. you know or your show with four chairs. Right. <laughs> no, I mean it's like you we can. We don't even it's, need panels. You don't need panels. <laughs> panels. <laughs> We're going off road. No, that's it. <laughs> But, uh, but, I, but that's, what I, that's why I'm loving it, and that's why I'm loving that, that there are a lot of young voices and people trusting our young voices and, and what we do, and just to keep trying different things. And the, there are no, there's no formula, you know, there's mm -hmm. no math like two plus two equals four, this plus this equals success, or this. It's just kind of, well, you go for it, and, and you see what, what, who, what people respond mm -hmm. to, and, and that, that to me is exciting. So. What's interesting, too, is the show I'm doing now, Now Hear This, is kind of a mapless, there's, there's nothing in front of us that, that, was, um, that was any kind of map for us to follow. It is a very non-traditional musical. It is very direct address storytelling, but inside that we also break that rule, and sometimes we do scenes with each other, we do songs, we do snippets of songs. We're asking the audience to go on this very sort of off-road journey with us, and it's working, which is, which is great. So on that hand, you have you know, this, this, this musical that is like nothing I've ever seen. And for people that take that ride, great, and some people do, don't. But, the, but like your musical, Mormon, is as, as, uh, as strange as the source is, it's such a traditional Broadway musical. Yes. So, you know, what, what you've done, and I mean, it's just sort of, it's it's very bold, very unusual, and yet very traditional. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think um, to do a traditional musical these days, you sort of need to have really super unorthodox subject matter, and then I think maybe to the converse of that, um, if you're doing a, a wildly abstracted, different form of storytelling, you kind of want something to hang on to mm -hmm. in the in the story you're telling. Uh, maybe more of a simpler story. That's sort of how I've 
chosen my projects. Avenue Q is, a, is like the simplest story and you know the most traditional subject matter. Um, it's boy meets girl and you know growing up in New York or you know living in New York. And uh, but the the form of storytelling is is different. And puppets and educational songs and stuff like that. Yeah. What do you feel like we need to do to continue to make sure that there are younger Heidi, Bobby, and Chris's out there that are falling in love with musical theater the way that you did, that are being developed, if you will. Audiences are so important for any show mm -hmm. and developing them and making sure that we're creating musicals that young audiences are going to want to see. Right. What, where do you think we're at with that? You know, I think um, <clears throat> I think there was a time that that Broadway was a little bit um, losing its way, maybe because um, at least certainly when I graduated college, liking musicals was not at all cool. It was not part of the popular culture. It was sort of it labeled you as you know something else. Um, and I've always loved musicals, but um, I always wanted to write something that connected with a large you know group of my peers and all that. So so I. Um, you know that's how I've I've always tried to write shows that I'd want to see and that my friends from college would want to see. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of that's part of how the, an art form stays relevant, that people don't treat it like this something else that's has, you have to follow rules or whatever. Um, you know, not this. You need a nun, a dog, and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Wait. And you Wait. just have nuns and dogs and Abraham Lincoln <laughs> forever. Um, but you know, it's I think one of the things is comedy. I think comedy has. Um, and all of us have been a part of that um, movement that, you know, there's, I was just thinking about it the other day that, that avant-garde comedy kind of started in the 60s maybe. Like, it's an English-speaking thing that comedy, um, comedy hasn't really developed as far in, in the non-English-speaking world, would you say that's possibly true? Sounds right. I, 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 it may just be ignorance on my part, but I kind of feel like there's no equivalent to Monty Python and, and Matt Stone and Trey Parker in, um, in Asia. Um, anyway, so, and, and musical theater is the same way. I don't think that there's the same, musical theater doesn't really exist in other languages in the, to the same degree mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, it does mm -hmm. in English. Um, and it's funny that musical theater kind of, st right, right when rock and roll started, was the same time that the great comedy stuff started really evolving, like Monty Python, and, um, and it's the same time that musical theater started to be a little bit maybe a little bit less, you know, mainstream, you know, popular songs st stopped coming out of it and all that mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so isn't that weird? So that during that time that comedy kind of, <laughs> co comedy kind of grew and evolved, musical theater kind of stayed flat and didn't really incorporate that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I feel like when our generation has come to musical theater, we've chosen to mix it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you, you couldn't see what musical theater and comedy had to do with each other unless you looked at musical send-ups like, the producers mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know the movie of the producers and, mm -hmm. and like the, the the musical send ups on The Simpsons and in South Park and mm -hmm. Best in Show and, and and that you know that stuff has been hugely influential to me and I feel like bringing that stuff into a show that still has uh, an emotional journey and doesn't mm -hmm. sacrifice all the wonderful things about musicals has been kind of a lot of what I've been doing and I think I think a lot about what we've been doing mm -hmm. um, in the last ten years you know Chris you have musicals like. Newsies and Godspell that seem to be kind of trying to mobilize a younger audience and appeal to a younger audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for I mean, Godspell definitely we 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 try to take a, 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 a you know kind of polish it up a bit, and Stephen was part of the process, and we changed some stuff, mixed some stuff up, and and tried to make it. You don't want to say accessible, but you know it. it we did change a few things to make it a little more contemporary, have a little more connection with the audience uh, in that. And, and Newsies, too, you know, part of what I feel, I hope we, I think, hope we succeeded doing, but is taking this, you know, 1899 true story, but kind of make it, tell it in a contemporary way that whether it be set, whether direction, whether it be Alan's music, whether it be my movement, it's, one of my favorite things about the show is is you're watching these boys t go on this journey. You know, they're 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 trying to make a place in the world. You know, they're trying to to make a difference and make a place in the world. And at the same time, you're watching these young gentlemen on stage doing the exact same thing in real time. You have these this ensemble and the, the cast just they're you're seeing them live go. This is me. This is my talent. This is how we're trying to push it forward. 
you know, the way they're dancing, some of the, I hate to use the word tricks, but like, but some of the specialty things they can do, that's them trying to push it all forward. Right. So you're watching the story of these kids trying to make a difference while you're watching this, these boys do it right in front of your eyes. And it's, it's this incredible combination that, um, I don't know, it just, it really, it moves me every time I, I, I watch them do it. Heidi, what's your perspective as one who has gotten to do maybe something pretty unlikely on mm -hmm. Broadway, like title of show? I mean, we've never we've never had a show like that on yeah. Broadway, and you must have a lot to think about and reflect on from that experience. Yeah, that was that was pretty uh, pretty miraculous that we made it as far as we made it to be able to stand in a place with the biggest megaphone. Um, it, it was extraordinary and and uh, that time for us is very um, I remember it very specifically because we were very grateful every day that we were there because we we knew we were misfit toys we knew it was every day that we were there was one more day of the miracle <laughs> um, so you know we were very grateful for that experience um, title of show was definitely a game changer for all of us um, it was the weirdest, you know, you were talking earlier about what do, what do, what do younger artists do when they want, to, they want to do this? How do they do this and how do we support them? Well, we, we did title of show and it was a part of the New York Musical Theater Festival and that's a great place for young artists to submit their material if they're lucky enough to be accepted into the festival and they accept so many. I'm not sure how many now they accept a year, but it's like, it's like, 30 shows, it's mm -hmm. a lot of shows. Oh, yeah. And um, and uh, we were lucky enough to be, and our show was so weird. It was weirder than it was on Broadway back then in the <laughs> festival, it was so <laughs> peculiar. And um, <laughs> I mean, it was still, it had the same heart, the same soul, but it was definitely a little more um, just uh, abstract. And, well, um, because you, you um, the dream, you know, when the off-Broadway version and the, and, the, and the workshop and the the nymph version, you were kind of, the dream was like, I wonder if the show could go to Broadway. Yeah, and, and I mean, and then though, in the Broadway version, it was like, can the show go to, go to Broadway? Yeah, I know. Here the we answer are. Is... I wonder if the show can go to the moon. <laughs> <I know>. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna be on the moon. Just next. on helmets. I know. <laughs> on helmets, just... That show was the weirdest thing because we called it the Golden Pony. Whatever we asked the Golden Pony, the Golden Pony would poop out the dream, and we would be Looking like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, we couldn't we couldn't believe that. And everybody said to us, like when we were at the festival, they said, oh, it's such a weird little show. It'll never make it off Broadway. And then we made it off Broadway. And then they said it'll never be a commercial run. And we had a commercial run off Broadway. And then they said it'll never be a Broadway show. And there it was on Broadway. So um, that was definitely the little show that could. Um, but we you know it wasn't a magical it wasn't a magical thing that ha it was in that we made it so far but we worked really hard on that show yeah and um we put in hours and hours and i would say even years without getting paid um and just carrying that show on our backs and and really we were the ones that said we've got this thing we've got this thing and mm -hmm. we invited the right people and you have to have chutzpah, you have to believe in it. I mean, sometimes you're doing something and you're like, I am so glad to be working, but this isn't necessarily, you know, the thing the that thing is that the I highlight of my career, you know? That happens all the time because you want to stay working and you want to stay involved. But title of show was not that. Title of show was really weird and really special. And I knew it from the second Jeff Bowen sent me a couple raggedy pages <laughs> and said, do you want to sing this for us? And I was like, I don't know what this is, but the answer is yes. I think it was special for everyone yeah, in the industry. Yeah. I mean, watching it at the Vineyard, we had just done Avenue Q at yeah. the Vineyard. and going to see that show there was so, it was like deja vu, because you were mm -hmm. telling this very universal story to anyone that creates anything, right. and uh, specifically musicals, which is this so, it's so, um, you know, collaborative, and there's so many, you know, there's a lot of budding of personalities and, and tests of the, of the bonds between creators, um, and all that stuff rang a bell yeah. um, for me when I was watching it. I was wondering, how it would feel to it to an even younger person that saw it before they had their shot, and if they would get deja vu when they were yeah. having their shot, you know, like, oh, <laughs> right. I saw this in title of show, you know, change it, don't change but it. Still, you know, I now during doing now here this, 
it's funny, when we were doing title of show at the Vineyard, our audiences weren't always full. And now, during, doing Now Hear This, our audiences are packed. And that's because of this audience that we managed to grow during mm -hmm. title of show, which mm -hmm. we're so grateful for. But last night, as I was exiting the theater, there were these young kids, like, I don't know, like young 20s, you know, going to college. And they, <laughs> they said to me, I was in high school when I first heard A Way Back to Then. And I was like, oh my God, mm -hmm. it's been around that long now that these kids are, I mean, in high school when, they're, when they were exposed to the material. And that's now having an effect on them that's going to, you know, who knows what their trajectory yeah. is going to be. And I am very proud to be in a business that, um, and especially with the 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 show in particular, with title of show, um, if it had anything to do, if it has anything to do with inspiring people to go forward and live your dream, then I mean, you know, that's great. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up about Nymph yeah. because that is a way for new musicals, new voices, new works mm -hmm. to get heard and new and new performers get totally. discovered and Bobby you've been part of workshops and you were also on the selection committee I believe for the Jonathan Larson grants that mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier. Oh yeah. Um, what are some of the forums you know for these types of things BMI, ASCAP? For writers yeah it's, I mean for me the BMI workshop was hugely um, formative. I, I graduated, I, I mentioned before that, I, that I've been like writing musicals my whole life mm -hmm. and I got to New York after college and I thought well I can handle this, I can do it um, and I thought I kind of knew everything because I had done so much you know, experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I didn't know how to work with people and I didn't really understand the idea of, of you know, how, why to write mm -hmm. and how to connect with people. I didn't really get any of that so, um, so I I, what I was trying, I was trying to um, become Alan Menken's assistant as soon as I graduated. I oh. tried to, I, I knew his, a friend who knew his sister, so I, I got in touch with her and she was like, you know, Alan's not looking for an assistant, but you know what he would tell you to do if you were talking to him, he'd say, join the workshop. So I joined the workshop and through that I met so many people, you know, Tom Kitt and Brian Yorkey oh. uh, were in my this class. This BMI? BMI, BMI, the BMI, BMI yeah. Layman Angle workshop. Um, uh, and I, you know, there were teachers there who knew so much about, you know, they give you a, um, the um, the the uh, the lingo you kind of the, the the jargon we use in the theater you learn how to talk about mm -hmm. musicals in a way that people understand what you're saying and um, and you have the experience every week of bringing in a song and seeing whether it lands mm -hmm. and I was I would bring in my songs you know the first year and they wouldn't land so it was a it was a huge eye opener just in just in terms of that just in terms of trying your songs for real for an audience and and meeting people your same age who want to do it and learning and figuring out like who am I in this right. business what do I what do I want to give to people instead of how do I want to show off for them it's mm -hmm. all about you know what do you have what do you have to say that is of any value to the world and what kind of person are you and what's your worldview that's the right. that's kind of what writing is all about it's not about I'm good at this I want to show off and I want to get attention you know it's not about that yeah and of course we have two shows on Broadway this season that came from the New York Theater Workshop once mm -hmm. and Peter and the Star Catcher. Mm -hmm. So participating in, the, you both surely must have participated in tons of those kinds of workshops and new works, Alter development boys. programs, yeah. Alter, Alter Boys. boys. Alter boys. Too. I, mm -hmm. I was on the panel this year to, to, to choose and, and it was great to see, I didn't realize, you know, I, I didn't realize that part of the process and it was yeah. great to be able to see these, these scripts and scores coming through and, and reading them and, and just, I don't know, it just it got me excited that there are that many people out there that are still trying to, again, and some of them were really offbeat and, and but, but just put, you know, again, there are no rules and they're just pushing envelopes and trying new things and trying new formats and trying, and it's great. You know, it's, it's great because some, someone's gonna take that one and go, go, and then they're gonna go and they're gonna expose us to something we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And that, that's always exciting to me, whether it's accepted or not or however it's received, but it's, that's that's the most exciting part to me, and it also it also gives young writers and um, and young actors too, uh, even even if it doesn't go forward, even if it's not picked up, it gives you the experience mm -hmm. of actually you know for writers especially getting your stuff up for the first mm -hmm. time and really learning how to collaborate, learning how to get a show actually up in this town, yeah, which is you know. Uh, it, 
it's hard. It's really, really hard. And you have to, you have to cut your teeth. You have to learn how to, how to do it. Mm -hmm. When we were doing title of show, it was, it was a gorgeous mess. It was a mess. And the venue we got was like, <laughs> we joked that it was like a cockfighting ring. <laughs> it, was, it was the weirdest venue. It was at the, um, you know where the was Zipper it, Theater, th was, right uh -huh. next to it, it used to be, it's now a restaurant, but I'm convinced it used to be a cockfighting ring. It used to be, um, or it's it wasn't called even the Belt. In the zipper, it was next to the Yeah, thing. it was called the Belt. Not, it's not <laughs> the zipper, it's the Belt. Oh, right, and, just um, above the zipper. Yeah, and we, <laughs> where the theater was, it was kind of on this platform where the audience was below you you and above you and so we had to figure I mean the, the I things was that above. wild <laughs> I, watched, above. I watched I watched right yeah. right but I mean there was so much that we had to change from that but it was such a great learning experience and what that did for us was it got us a commercial producer involved but even if you don't even if something magical doesn't happen to you I think as an artist whether you're a writer or a performer you get you get to do something in New York from yeah. start to finish. Yeah. And even if all you get is a Metro card for your <laughs> time and work, <laughs> you get you got to do something in New York and it's something you can invite your agent to mm -hmm. or if you're shopping for an agent, you can invite people, prospective agents to come and see it. And um, that's an important thing because getting seen in New York um, is not easy. Yeah. It's totally not easy. But yeah. that festival and festivals like it um, offer that to young mm -hmm. writers and artists. You know, I bet it's funny, like, there's a, there's a saying that, that your first show is never, it becomes your calling card, it never gets produced, but, you know, it becomes sort of like, here, I wrote this, yeah. and, and you can meet me, and I'm <laughs> yeah. fun to work with. Um, but your show, like, you're, by the end of your show, you feel like, I want to work with those people, I want to know them, I, I want to be in them. business with them. I feel like you kind of killed two birds with one stone. Yeah, that was, that was what was so great about our show. <laughs> We're talking a lot about title of show, but it was the greatest <laughs> audition in the world. Yeah. Right on message. And, and the same thing with Now Hear This, because we use ourselves as, as the source of all the raw material. Right. So um, whether, you know, it's for, for, <laughs> for better and for worse, we are up there uh, being a, a version mm -hmm. of ourselves. I mean, there's there's certainly some type, we call, we call it autobiophictionography <laughs> because, um, you know, all of it's true except for the big honkin' lies. <laughs> um, and there are lies. Like Mike Daisy. <laughs> the other thing that I did that, I, I don't know, if, did you do theater works ever? Yeah, no, uh, that was that was my, that That's was my intro. Big one. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't have a, a show, I didn't really have a break or anything like that. But getting experience was so important and, uh, and theater works, even though I don't know why I did it, I did it, to, to get experience, mm -hmm. really, and then that experience serves you because, you know, I, <laughs> well, Jeff Marks and I were writing in the BMI workshop. You put one song up at a time, and you, and they seem to work. Um, so, and we we were we felt like we were really you know, good at it, and we we told <laughs> Barbara Pasternak, who was the head of Theater Works, we said, you know, we we're good because we can kind of nail it the first time. You know, <laughs> get a song. We don't have to do many rewrites because. <laughs> We, kinda, we, kinda, we work at it so hard that it's right. Oh and she was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then our, our show, that Ferdinand the Bull, our first show, um, you know, we, I think we, <laughs> no, I think we, we must have written 30 songs for a six song show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's great though. Yeah. No, it's, you know, you have to learn that there's a difference between a good song and the right song. Yeah. Bobby, you mentioned being very uncool for liking Did theater. Did I mention that? Well. <laughs> Not now. Is now that, you're the coolest kid in town. <laughs> but at a, at a certain point, musical theater, liking musical theater did not make you cool. Mm -hmm. I think title of show had a cool factor. Um, and I'm curious just what you each think about the fact that we're now in a point where we're seeing musical theater on primetime television. Right. Mm -hmm. And whether that has a cool factor. Is, that, is musical theater cool again? I think I think so. I mean, the kids, the the younger kids I know that are coming up are are really interested in Glee, and um, I, I think I think that's awesome. I think people actually in the industry have very strong feelings about <laughs> shows like Glee and Smash. Yes. Um, but you know, say what you will, those shows have definitely made an impact on this industry, mm -hmm. for better and for worse. Mm -hmm. They have put us back in the spotlight, and I don't know if it's made us cool, but it, sure, it certainly has um, shined a light on us in a brand new way. And I do think it's good for our industry. I think it's made, you know, people 
all over America that may not have been exposed to musical theater stuff suddenly have an interest, mm -hmm. and that's good, you know. And and a lot of the ground that they're covering, you know, yeah. I, I think is is really important, especially with, you know, I think about Ryan Murphy and all the good stuff he's done for the gay community, and um, I think that's really important for mm -hmm. that to get injected into America at large. Yeah. So it's good. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. And I also think there are, there are a lot more opportunities. There are more opportunities. I think like what you were saying earlier b about, you know, Broadway was it was it was kind of not finding its way, and then I feel like there's the, the diversity of what's out there right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can play an instrument and be in a show, and you can, you know, be a puppeteer. You could do. There are so many so, uh, more skill sets that that mm -hmm. you're that you're open to now that, to be in a show. You can have a rock voice. You can have a pop voice. You can have musical theater voice, you can, you know, sing opera, you can, it's just, it feels like there are more, up, more diverse opportunities to yeah. be a part of what Broadway is and not mm -hmm. like, oh, I have my standard, this song to sing, or mm -hmm. it, it just feels a little more, the game's a little more open. It's such an irony because I think getting into this business was like the riskiest thing that I could possibly say to my parents, you know, <laughs> 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 like, oh, you want to do that, uh -huh, okay, <laughs> somehow you'll make money, I guess, maybe <laughs> one day, but, um, it's funny that the way the way that history has kind of turned out, the internet has fractured all the other forms of entertainment, and to the point where now I think you know there kind of is no clear definition of what is the music industry, mm -hmm. what is the film industry, what is TV anymore. It's really hard to. It's all becoming this one computer media thing, mm -hmm. and it's all omnipresent. Mm -hmm. And I think theater is more special than that. Theater has remained the same. It's always going to be magical because you're you are there, and that's. That's, that's sort of the message of live theater. It puts you in the now, and it, it gets you in a community with other people. And, and you know, what, what media does is kind of isolates us and isolates us in our point of view. Mm -hmm. And what theater does is it, it can actually open you up and mm -hmm. challenge your point of view and, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even change your point of view. Um, we always go to a, a, to a musical for, hopefully, a transformative experience, something that you will never forget and something that touches you deeply and hopefully... Um, changes the changes your outlook in some small way and it's also a shared experience yes. too that you're sitting next to people that are there that same night that Patty Lapone yelled at the guy with yeah. the cell phone like you're you are sharing something that is truly singular that is only for you in those 100 minutes or right. however long that show is and that is is very unusual in this age where we are so distracted with you know, all the devices in our hands and, um, you know, just every, every single thing that, that calls us away from being present in our own lives. Mm -hmm. and, um, and theater makes you hold still for a second and yeah. you get to share that moment with, you know, however many people are in the theater with you that night. Absolutely. And the feeling that this moment will never come again. Yeah. You know, these lines will be said. Yeah. These songs will be sung. These steps will be danced, but yeah. this same. particular yeah. moment will never come again. It and is that true. That is just magical. That's also, well, also the extremely f most frustrating thing <laughs> about musicals because <laughs> you have, you know, when you're developing them, you, you see the, I mean, if you're lucky enough, you see your vision one night. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, the next and then, night, and then if you're really lucky, you're, wrong. you're in your... <laughs> Notes. <laughs> <laughs> you're in. You're in a. You know. If you get. If you're lucky enough to have a have a many year running show, mm -hmm. then it's a many year running. Like, well, it wasn't as good as last night. It wasn't as good or the night before that. It's right. It's you're constantly comparing. There's the it. bar, right? Whereas, I mean, imagine if you had a DVD, your favorite DVD, that when you played it, every time it got a little bit broader <laughs> or a little bit worse, the <laughs> orchestra shrank. <laughs> Changed locations, <laughs> changed venues. The actors got a little bit worse. <laughs> That's my nightmare. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there's where musicals have been, and we're kind of talking about where they are now. I mean, I have seen things on stage, mostly from your shows, that, <laughs> that I don't know that I ever thought I would see in a musical. Um, where do we think that's headed with edginess and needing it to be relevant to our new world full of devices? And is there anything on Broadway that we won't see? <laughs> no, I hope not. Yep. I hope not. I, as long as it's a, it's good storytelling, I say 
anything goes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good show too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but sincerely, I, I, as long as some nerd who is coming up, who is talented, can tell a good story, and it's about coal mining on the moon, I'm like, yes, as long as it's good storytelling, um, I think, I hope it goes crazy. Mm -hmm. I hope we see things that we can't even imagine in this conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, I hope it's limitless. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things about Broadway is that it's been, it, it, it doesn't have a censorship apparatus. Um, and it's also been heavily self-censored for all of its history. So it is fair game. Like the, the envelope is very like small. Yeah. It's, it's ready for pushing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, what were you going to say about the just the the censorship factor or the boundaries factor or where is there anything that we can't do in a musical? I don't think there's anything we can. I mean that and and again that's what you know and we can and it ha and also I like that things can be appropriate for where they are like w like with silence it's downtown and it's you know it's there's a lot of strong language and and right. such but. It's not. It's not. It's something that I feel it's it's right size for where it is because mm -hmm. people we we did we got pretty good response and, and people were like oh do you want to move it because everything has to move everything has to move mm -hmm. right. I was like but no actually I, I I love where it is I love that it's a downtown show I love that you know it's these this tight you know packed houses mm -hmm. and and I it, and it that's where it, it needs to be and and I think it, and that's great too I feel like not everything has to be. Uh, on Broadway, it could be it could be in a site-specific place. It could be in a, you know, like what they've done with Fifty Four and what they did, you know, yeah. they did Cabaret there, or when they take in other theaters and done a little more site-specific, you know, opportunities with with shows. I, I think that's great, and it's again, it's it's pushing pushing things around or, or Godspell, like putting it in the round. Right. I love like I love it in the round. It's just yeah, I mean, and and just the idea that it's communal, like you're watching them, but you're looking across, mm -hmm. literally watching community what the whole show is about and it, right. there's something really special about that and what that immediately does to the show mm -hmm. and so uh yeah so no or Lissa Strata Jones and the, when they did it in the gym mm -hmm. right exactly you know? site mm -hmm. specific and yeah absolutely which was really effective I thought for that show so I want to know what's next you know where where do we think the next the, the next vision of musicals is, is going. What, what is there still that we need to explore? What do we want to hear and see? One thing that has been important to me as an artist continuing to evolve is now with my collaborators, um, I, along with them, we are starting to make our own work. I mean, title show was our own and now here this is our own, but a lot of times, um, you know, this doesn't necessarily apply to you guys, but as a, as a performer, you are an actor for hire and you just hope that something is available to you that is a good fit. Mm -hmm. And you can read a script and say, I, I'm, I think I can really, I can really do that. But it, it, you kind of have to wait for those opportunities. And as, as being a part of this collaboration with Susan Blackwell, Hunter Bell, Jeff Bowen, Michael Barras, Larry Presgrove, um, we have decided not to wait for somebody else to tell us what to do, and we are making our own work. And um, Jessica Malaski came to see the show. She's a wonderful actress. Mm -hmm. If you don't know who she is, she's fantastic. She came to see the show the other night, and she said, I'm so glad you did not wait for someone to tell you what to do, that you just are making your own work. Yes. And... Um, I certainly for writers, obviously they're going to make what they want to make. But as well, but actress, actually, you know, it's, that's analogous to the idea of you know doing an adaptation versus doing an original story. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think there's been a a, uh, a bit of you know I think you know traditionally the musical theater is an adaptive art form. You know, Oklahoma, all the Rodgers and Hammerstein, none of those shows were 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 original stories except Allegro. I, I don't know, um, and. Um, and now I feel like there's there's more original musicals like just just lis listening to the title show category of of you know original musicals versus right. adaptations of movies or books or plays or whatever um, you know at the, it's not it's not any easier to write an adaptation than it is to write an original story but mm -hmm. I kind of feel like you know that's original stories is it's it's a it's more of a you know 
you can you can clear that brush and right. and find your own um, find your own patch of land to farm. I think that's that's a great answer to this question that we have seen such a in the pa in the recent past there has been such a trend for revivals and um, and material that already exists to be turned in to, to be turned into musicals and I think especially with Mormon um, and shows. Thank you. <laughs> um, that it is, I mean, thank God for an original musical right. that, that mm -hmm. works, that is also showing the rest of us it can work, it can, and it can work on, on the grandest scale. You know, I well, know that's, and that's something, another soapbox I happen to have with me. Um, <clears throat> the idea that... Um, <laughs> Stand on it, there's please. A, there's, um, <laughs> there's, there's this area of original musicals that are actually kind of unproducible right now by by mo you know it's it's the exception to the rule that you can have a risky original big musical you can't have those three things mm -hmm. even mormon isn't that big you know mm -hmm. we have nine players in the pit we have a cast of I, I forget how many but it's actually one of the it's probably the limit of how big you can do you can produce uh you know an original slightly risky story um i would love to see you know something that's that's got a big chorus that's got sets mm -hmm. that's got spectacle you used to be able to see that you know in in the 80s you know Andrew Lloyd Webber was able to 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 uh, command those that you know that that kind of investment from yeah from, from you know and, th and those were amazing mm -hmm. and um, I just feel like we haven't seen a grand crazy big hit right original in a long time and I would yeah, love to true. write something like that I feel like you know we need investors need to get a little bit I mean, and, and uh, you know, if it was my money, I'm not writing that check. I would, I would never do that. But, um, uh, but I, th I think I think there is there's so much to see in that pocket of um, of of un unborn entertainment. Yeah. That um, that we wanted because there's, we've seen the small the little show that could. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Now we need to. But it's hard, do the big right? Shows I think it's can. so terrifying because there's so much to lose. Yeah. There's it's I, such a risky business. And what I'm and I'm seeing the trend like with those scripts that I would see that would come across for the nymph and all. Like I think writers now are afraid to write something big. I think yeah. they're hesitant to mm -hmm. to go. I need a chorus of thirty right. because of of. It, it needs it'll never get produced people, right. Right? right right and then they, they I think they immediately just they they and check inhibited. themselves and go you know what I shouldn't do that because no one's gonna write a check for 30 so I met and, and I can kind of you can feel that in the writing where I'm like I think that could have been fleshed out more or th or they could have had a few more friends or this could have had another family or mm -hmm. but I think people are checking themselves and they're not letting themselves really go forward with an idea without checking the oh well oh shoot and that's another location so I shouldn't do that <laughs> yeah set. right and then, you know right. and I you can feel that and I mean I've, I've been in those <laughs> yeah we've all been in those conversations where it's like how much can you shrink something down yeah. to make it you know, producible, and and that's I, I understand it, but at the same time, it's frustrating because you kind of want to just do that. You want to have, you know, South Pacific with forty people in an mm -hmm. orchestra of thirty-five, like, and that shouldn't be that shouldn't be an, a, a rarity. It should. You don't want to just go to know. Broadway for cool indie things. You want to see yeah. big things, right. and you want them to be challenging and smart and funny and of the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what a great reveal in South Pacific when the orchestra pit would be revealed mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that would roll back and you saw all those people and a yeah. harp and you know. 538 music yeah. that never, I mean it, it never was happens. thrilling. And, thrilling. and you, could he, you could feel the audience oh. and their anticipation Gasp. and their excitement and their gasp and I think when I saw it even applause yeah, you know, because are, yeah. everyone is so thrilled that and we're going to get a big lavish musical. And there's that again. There's right. that one night only mm -hmm. experience that you get to have yeah. that is a very it's such a wonderful experience to have that night at South Pacific and then to also have that night at Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. Right. But it is, I do feel like it is time for like a big original spectacle mm -hmm. again. One that is smart and thought provoking and weird and fantastic, but also, you know, has a camel on stage. <laughs> Yeah, go to the Radio Pyro. City Rockettes yeah. Christmas Spectacular. <laughs> you want to see something like that, but not about Jesus. Yeah. And not about Santa. Yeah. Right. Or, or with Jesus and Santa, but not that same story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Working on a revival, as well as so many original shows and revivals, you've done, you know, so many different things in your experience. What are the similarities and differences with... Um, with telling a story that we maybe already know, 
or telling something that we're that we're going to find out about. Well, the the, the great things. I mean, the two most recent, uh, well, Godspell and and then Sunny in the Park and 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 South Pacific. It's 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 always interesting to revisit them and go, well, why is it relevant? Mm. Because why are we doing it if it's mm -hmm. not relevant? And and to see each of those those three right there, just what what the just the con the concept was and the conceit was to to uh, make them happen. It was. It, it, every, each one inspired me in different ways because it, it, they, w they are still relevant and they all had something important to say. And, um, you know, like how the video was, the projection was used during Sunday in the Park. It was thrilling because the whole show was about art. I mean, it just, it, it was, you know, staggering to me. And, um, but what I'm loving about new works, and even though Newsies was on film, the, the, the transfer to stage to get to write fleshed out dance breaks. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never really had that opportunity. This was like my first kind of big dance show and to be able to sit down and go, okay, what are we doing? How do we tell the story <laughs> through this dance break? And to have someone sit there and go, okay, well, this is where they're gonna come together. Oh, they need a challenge here, they need it, you know, and to have that happen in a show was, I mean, that's when little Chris, the 14 year old, I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. shaking inside because like, this is gonna live on. Like I'm, this, now that it's opened, that dance break will remain with the show forever and I feel like I've created like it's now history, and it's, it's it you know it's thrilling to be a part of something like that, mm -hmm. and um, so it, it you know so and then there, the next step is a little box around your name like Jerome Robbins. Oh, yeah. oh. No, <laughs> I want that seat in the theater. That's what I want. I want that seat every night that I get to sit in. Are you listening? I've asked for no. Um, <laughs> but it's but it is it, it's it's so it's so it, it's I love being a part of something like that because you, just being able to leave your mark and being able to tell your the way the story the way you would like to tell it and. At, with with the cast you have and, and the creatives and the collaboration, it's it, there's nothing really like it, mm -hmm. really. And I do think revivals are so important. It it is important for us to look back in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. And all the ones that you mentioned, I do think um, it's as long as long as someone has something to say uh, and a point of view. As mm -hmm. long as your director is that good captain of that ship and really has. Um, something important to say with material like the shows you mentioned, um, it is it is important for us mm -hmm. to be able to see those shows. You know, I had never seen South Pacific. Um, I had heard it, of course, and was very very familiar with it, but I had never seen it until I saw the revival, and I was like, oh my god, yeah. that is an important piece of our musical theater history. Absolutely, and um, it's it's I I, I feel. Uh, better as an artist just having that experience in my arsenal so I can move forward just knowing it. Mm -hmm. um, it is important to look back, mm -hmm. definitely. And you've been part of a big movie property yep. style show. Yeah, a couple. You are currently involved right. in a movie property show. You have references to many <laughs> movie, pro well, and, a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> many references. <laughs> What do we feel about that? Is that um, is that just a commercial decision? Is it just a paycheck decision? You know, trying to, as you said before, there's no formula right. at all, and, and so it's just trying something that maybe you think will work. Or is right. there a place for that on our Broadway stages? It's it's interesting. I mean, I, I can. Only, I mean, I'll I mean, I'll speak for the Newsies because I feel like when Newsies came out. It, I saw it, I was one of those kids, I'm a fan, I'm a fancy. <laughs> I was a fancy, I was one of those boys, I was, like, I, was, I was a huge fan of the movie. It inspired me to, to dance and to make myself better. And, but, um, but I think that's, a, to me, Newsies is a great example of, the movie was flawed or it was, did whatever it did, but I felt like that story on stage, it, it, it just made it better, it mm -hmm. made, Everything better about it, and um, and to just you know have Harvey take a new look at certain things mm -hmm. and, and what he did to it. But um, I, and I don't think it was such like, oh, everyone's going to run out and see Newsies because technically they right. can't consider it a flop. <laughs> so it was like, they no, were, there was a reason to do it. There, yeah, was, a, there, was, there, was, yeah. there was a total reason to go. You know what? We can make this better. There's mm -hmm. a story here, and there's great music, and and there's opportunity for great dancing. And and to me, it was a perfect reason why something should make that leap. I mean, I know there are other situations where I think sometimes producers just do that, like, oh, that's a great title, and I know we can wrangle them in, but, um, but speaking, I can speak for that one and say that I, I do, f like, I'm proud to be a part of it, and mm -hmm. I, I feel like it was a, it was a good decision to, to be able to, 
take that to the stage and, and make it a musical because mm -hmm. I feel like that's where it deserves, it really can live on stage. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that movies, you know, the successful movies that get adapted um, sometimes get adapted because that's the kind of thing that makes people safe enough to write a check. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you say like, okay, I, I know that I can get people to come see that because it's that. Um, and people will come see it and then they'll like it and they'll tell their friends and it'll be a big hit and we'll all get paid. <laughs> um, but um, they're, they're, at the same time as that, there needs to be that reason that the writer is doing it that's not just the paycheck. There needs to be that reason that the, the writer is, you know, so excited to do. You know, they, and they also say, you know, never, don't adapt something that's perfect. Don't adapt a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. um, always, have, always have there be somewhere to go with it that you know where it's going that, that people don't know. Right. You know? So, and, you know, when I, I we did, um, I, I wrote a show for a theme park called Finding Nemo the Musical. Um, and I that, enjoyed that so oh, much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I did. Um, no, and it, it was it was a labor of love, and it, it broke that rule of like, don't don't adapt a masterpiece because I think that movie is like mm -hmm. yeah. is, is gold. Um, and but it was so much fun to do, and my you know my wife and I had just become parents, and we wrote it together, and was mm -hmm. kind of about you know us becoming parents to us anyway. Oh. So we were able to pour some feeling into it, and I think it you know I think it's it it lives right where it should live. Um, and uh, and and so I think you know, it adapt adaptations are can be can be wonderful, mm -hmm. and uh, you know certainly certainly I always try and go see them all. So yeah, so there's some reason for them. Yeah, and I think it's important to know why. I mean, too, because sometimes a movie is is did well because of a particular performance or a particular. You know, so I think it's it's knowing like again it all goes back. It always every conversation always goes back to story. But like, is the story good? Is it a good strong story that then can live, or what can we do with the story to make it, you know, viable on stage? And I think, um, you know, I've been I've been in a couple of big uh, commercial Broadway extravaganzas, Little Mermaid and Adam's Family, and and um, those adaptations were. Uh, uh, did did not do well critically. Um, did very well commercially. Mm -hmm. um, even though I know that Tom Schumacher would say that uh, Little Mermaid concluded far sooner than anybody would have wanted. But I think with both of those ventures, those creative teams at the beginning, um, even though they had very recognizable commodities, and like what you were saying, they knew that you know there was going to be a built-in audience there. That um, I, I know that they when they were creating at the table, had the dream of transcendence. But it doesn't always work. Right. It doesn't always work. Right. And, um, and then you, you are left with a lot of investors <laughs> and a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> who need a product, and you do the best you can. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, you know, we were lucky both of those shows made very good money and are having lives beyond Broadway, which sure. is fantastic, mm -hmm. but were not critically well received in this town. Yeah. It's so interesting what goes into making musicals happen. And again, no formula. No, if everyone knew what the formula was, they would do it. <laughs> Every show would that be would a hit. Every show would be a hit, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> I didn't make that Bring one. out the nuns. <laughs> well, I really want to thank each of you for your contributions here today. I love talking about musicals with you. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Julie James, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. There is so much more to the American Theatre Wing than just the Tony Awards. The American Theatre Wing's website has a wealth of information. There's about 700 hours of material on the website. <laughs> 700 hours? That's a lot of material. Here's the jam, everybody. It's free. There are videos, there are podcasts that you can download right onto your iPod. You see artists talking about what inspires them and why they got into the business. It's great to be able to hear people like Stephen Sondheim, Patti Lapone, Doug Wright, Scott Ellis, Donna McKechnie. Programs like Springboard NYC and the Theater Intern Group are great opportunities for young people who are trying to get into the business. The Jonathan Larson grants for new composers are great. And it's just another example of how The Wing is doing wonderful work in fostering the talents of young writers and artists. What the American Theater Wing does with these programs is it emerges immerses you with artists currently working the business. What the wing provides is inspiration. I'm Jen Damiano. I'm Hunter Bell. I'm Bobby Steggert. I'm Saikon Simbla. If you love theater, 
go to americantheaterwing.org. It's all there on americantheaterwing.org. Click over and check it out. You might learn something.